Patita nam pavane bio, Vaishnavi bio, namo namaha. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda, Shri Advaita Gadadha, Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktavinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. All right, so. Recording in progress. Would somebody like to tell me briefly what one thing, one, one thing you remembered from class yesterday? Let's hear from the man. Any of the men can tell me one thing from the class yesterday? Maharaj, I was, uh, when we were hearing about Kamsa, although he was repentant, but then I also, I mean, we also heard that uh, he was putting the blame on destiny. So maybe uh, what I uh, understood is that he was not taking the complete uh, blame on himself. Okay, very good. Yes, he was like saying it's all destiny and it was their karma, those children, what can be done about it, not my fault. Okay, that's one thing. Anything else? Maharaj. Yes, yes Prabhu. Prabhu, you go ahead, please. We also heard that uh, <clears throat> Kamsa was very repentant of his uh, actions. As he, he tried to please his uh, sister and uh, brother-in-law. But at the same time, he had his own plans. He said that, how could I actually give away that particular child or spare the child who's going to be? <coughs> So he was trying to justify from his own angle. And uh, as uh, it is mentioned, that even Devaki said that uh, in her political way of trying to appease him, that it is all about destiny. And uh, further comes also stated that it is all about destiny and their bad karma. But an interesting aspect of it is immediately he consulted soon after this the plans with his ministers how to eliminate this son of Devaki. So it showed that he was actually very duplicious and a highly politically motivated person. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Okay, so we're going on now. Ch chapter number five is entitled Meeting of Nanda Maharaj and Vasudev. But actually the chapter begins with the description about the birth, the Vedic birth ceremony which was arranged in the home of Nanda Maharaj. Because Nanda Maharaj of course was blessed with a son. So we hear in the first verse, Nanda Maharaj was very magnanimous and when Lord Krishna appeared as his son, he, he was naturally overwhelmed because we're told Nanda Maharaj was elderly. He's older than Vasudev, his hair is actually described as being grey. So maybe he's like 50 or more years old. And uh, Prabhupada said 50 is old, right? He said even 40 is old. <laughs> so. Uh, Nanda Maharaj was in elderly age, but he was blessed with a son. Blessed. You know, it's different today, you know, people, they don't want children often. They try to avoid it. And they do so many evil things to try to avoid the responsibility of having children. But Nanda Maharaj and his wife, Mother Yashoda, they were anxious to have a, a child. And they had, as described actually, they'd perform many yagyas to even get a child. But it took a long time before they were successful. So when they were finally successful, naturally, he was very happy. And Nanda Maharaj wanted to do everything nicely. So he arranged to, per to perform a, a nice uh, s celebration of the, the arrival of their child. Especially, it was fortunate that they'd been blessed with a son. Because usually in old age, it's di more difficult to get a son. Usually you'll find the sons come first and then the daughters. And especially in old age, it's, it's more difficult to, it's, it's rare that you'll be blessed with a son. 
So Nanda Maharaj was certainly very fortunate. And not only was he happy, but all the people in Braja, in Vrindavan, in uh, Goku, where he was staying, they were also very happy because Nanda Maharaj is like the king of the cowherds. He wasn't actually a king, we're told, but uh, we're told uh, it's called like that because then we can make Krishna a prince. And princes are always very attractive to the other young ladies. The young ladies like princes, so it makes Krishna even more attractive if we call Nanda Maharaj the king of the cowherds. So Krishna is the prince, the son of the king of the cowherds. So we're told, uh, after bathing and purifying himself, dressing himself properly, he invited brahmanas. Of course, uh, it was Lord Krishna appeared at the same time as Vasudev's child. Vas at the same time, Devaki gave birth in the prison house of Kamsa. At that same moment, Mother Yashoda delivered her child. And then, of course, there was a second child Mother Yashoda delivered. But Lord Krishna, uh, Mother Yashoda, her child is Sham Sundar Krishna. And Vasudev and Devaki, their child is Vasudev Krishna. So after the birth of Shamsundar Krishna, Nanda Maharaj wants to arrange a nice ceremony. And he invited the Brahmanas who knew how to recite Vedic mantras. After having these qualified Brahmanas recite Vedic hymns, he arranged to have the Vedic birth ceremony celebrated for his newborn child according to the rules and regulations. And he also arranged for worship of the demigods and forefathers. So he didn't actually do the worship of the demigods and forefathers, but he arranged for it to be done. So it's mentioned also an important part in this section in this first verse is uh, the jati karma ceremony jata karma jata karma that which means that it, it's uh, at that time when they do the jata karma ceremony at that time the umbilical cord connecting the child to the mother is cut now Krishna, Lord Krishna had been brought by Vasudev to the house of Nanda Maharaj. But there was no, Nanda, Vasudev was so overwhelmed when he saw this child that he completely forgot about the Jata Karma ceremony. And he just brought the child over to the Nanda Maharaj's house. So in the purport, Prabhupada explains how Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur says that because this uh, ceremony was done, the, the Jata Karma ceremony, this proves the evidence that Krishna actually took birth as the son of Yashoda before the birth of Yoga Maya. In the previous chapter, Actually, one thing which I didn't point out, which I regretted yesterday, which I should have pointed out, that in text number nine, in chapter number four, it mentions, it mentions about the younger sister. So the younger sister of the Lord, that was Durga or Yoga Maya. So she was described in that way, proving that Mother Yashoda actually gave birth to two children. And there are several other verses also in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in this 10th canto, which also describe the, the same thing, right? Yesterday we had text number 9, chapter 4, and then verse 14 in chapter 8, and then again it comes up in chapter 14, text number 1. And then there are other scriptures also, particularly scriptures like Harivamsa 
all describing that Mother Yashoda actually gave birth to two children and not one. So when Vasudev brought his son over, he brought over Vasudev Krishna. So what happened then? Ramakrishna Prabhu, what happens? Vasudev brings his son Vasudev Krishna over to the home of Nanda Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. So after he brings it over to Yashoda's place, he exchanges the child there and uh, he finds a girl besides Yashoda and he drops the son besides her and picks up the other child. So we don't have a very clear note mentioned within this verses where the other child of uh, Yashoda, the elder child who must have been the Krishna there, present. So the Acharyas have commented saying that this Vasudeva Krishna merged into the Yashoda Krishna and that's how he was left over there. Yes, right. The Vasudeva form of Krishna merges into the Shamsundar form of Krishna. Now the child who appeared to Vasudeva and Devaki, he was born with four arms. But the child who was born to Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj was two arms. So Shamsundar Krishna. And uh, where does Krishna actually take birth from? Does he actually come from the womb? In, in this particular verse, it is referred as uh, Mana, means the Lord actually was uh, inspiring. Vasudeva within his mind because he already resides there as the super soul. The Lord appears, not from the womb, not like an ordinary child. He actually came from the heart. So how could they do this, uh, this, <laughs> this Jata Karma ceremony? That's an interesting thing to be understood. How could they do the Jata Karma when he came from the heart? Well, Maharaj? Yes? I have a question. So, oh, oh. Does, it, does it mean that Mother Yashira has uh, twins? Well, she gave birth to two children. Certainly she gave birth to two children. Yeah, we could, you can say <laughs> twins. But yeah. remember, we told Vasudev came over in the middle of the night. Everyone was asleep. Nobody knew. And Mother Yashoda was also tired from the labor. And by the influence of Yoga Maya, she'd forgotten that she'd delivered two children. Yes. So, the, the one boy which Vasudev brought merged into the boy which Mother Yashoda had delivered, who's Shamsundar Krishna, and Vasudev took the girl over to Mathura. And she revealed herself as a demigod. Durga. So we don't usually refer to Mother Yashoda as having twins, but you could speak of it like that because certainly she gave birth to two children, one after the other. First of all, at the same time Devaki was delivering Krishna in Mathura, at that same time Mother Yashoda was delivering Krishna in, in uh, Goku. Yes? Yes, thank you, Maharaj. So Krishna is twice born. <laughs> well, one is Shamsundar Krishna, one is Vasudev Krishna. A little difference. We, we saw the difference. One is four-armed and one is two-armed, right? It's Swai, Swayam Bhagavan Krishna who appears to Mother Yashoda. But the Krishna who appears to Vasudev and Devaki, that is the uh, Prabhav Prakash form of Lord Krishna described by the Acharyas like that. Remember, the, the, the mood of Vasudeva and Devaki is not in the same mood as Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj. They have a different kind of uh, attitude, worship. That is why Vasudeva and Devaki, they're seen offering prayers when the Lord appeared to them. But Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, they don't offer prayers because they have 
kevala bhakti. They have the just one hundred percent pure bhakti. But Vasudev and Devaki, they have they're also nichasiddhas, they're also pure devotees, but their bhakti is mixed with some uh, Aishwarya, with some with some gyan also. Because remember we told how they were desiring to have the Lord as their child for three births. Do you remember that from the third chapter? They, they were, but Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, whenever Krishna comes, they are always his mother and father. So Vasudeva and Devaki, they got to give birth to the Lord, but then they were in the prison house of Kamsa, and they had to take Krishna to save, they wanted to protect Krishna, because they are also in Vatsalya Ras. So they want to protect Krishna, so they took Krishna over to the home of Nanda Maharaj, who was a very dear friend. We'll hear in this chapter how Nanda Maharaj and Vasudeva, they're brothers actually. So Nanda, Mahar Nanda Maharaj was given the child, Shamsundar Krishna, but he didn't know. He didn't know it was Vasudeva's child. It was all done secretly. Vasudeva came in the night, everyone was sleeping, he didn't tell anyone, he simply changed the, child, the children. He substituted his child for their, he took their child, the female child, who was delivered by Mother Yashoda. Right? So this Jata Karma ceremony was performed. How could it be performed when Krishna takes birth from the heart? Well, Krishna can arrange it by his inconceivable potency because he wants to satisfy the mind of his devotee, Nanda Maharaj. So Nanda Maharaj, just for the pleasure of Nanda Maharaj, Krishna arranged that they could actually go through this whole thing, cutting the umbil um umbilical cord. And this um, cutting of the umbilical cord is done after they begin the Jata Karma ceremony. It comes after you begin the Jata Karma ceremony. This described, the procedures are described. You know that before they actually cut the cord, first of all the child is delivered from the, from the womb, and then the father is supposed to put something, some uh, auspicious grains or something in uh, powdered rice or something into the mouth of the child. And then after he does that, then only, then he will give permission to the brahmanas to cut the umbilical cord. So this is the, the ritual. This is uh, one of the samskars. And it, it's actually beneficial. We'll hear as we go on in this chapter, it's described the benefit of it. All right? Any other questions? Uh, Maharaj? Yes. The, because the, the just brings, it makes it difficult to understand because if, if Vasudev brings Krishna, then how does he uh, get his umbilical cord? Uh, I mean, it just make it, it's more confusing. Yes, but I'm, I'm telling you how they do it, right? Krishna does it by his inconceivable potency. Right? Because Krishna has also appeared, remember there's two Krishnas, so that one Krishna Vasudeva brought merges into the one who had appeared in the home of Nanda Maharaj. So you're left with one Krishna, right? Yes. And that one Krishna had been born in the home of Nanda Maharaj. So that's where they cut the umbilical cord. Okay, okay. I can. Yes? So that point is discussed at some length in the purport. The, and this helps to prove that Mother Yashoda actually gave birth to two children. Maharaj, also yesterday we heard from uh, this uh, Yogamaya when Krishna was about to dash her fist on. She said, the, the child who is going to kill you has already taken birth somewhere. So that's also a proof that Krishna had taken birth not in the prison but somewhere, somewhere means in the Gokul. 
Okay, yes. The child who's meant... Yeah, but of course the child who's going to do the killing was, is actually the Vasudev Krishna, <laughs> right? It's actually Vasudev Krishna. It's not the Shamsundra Krishna. Shamsundra Krishna, he doesn't do the killing. The killing of the demons is done by Vasudev Krishna. So, it, it wasn't actually true that the child who's meant to kill you has taken birth some other place. Of course, he'd gone some other place, but, <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's an interesting point. But these words were spoken just to agitate the mind of Kamsa and let him know that he has to worry, he has to think how to, what to do, how to save himself. And so this is all, all of these things are arranged by the pastime potency of the Lord. Is that all right? Yes, thank you, Maharaj. So Prabhupada writes in the purport there towards the end of text number two, Nanda Maharaj did not see whether the, co the cord was cut or not. Thus he performed the ceremony very gorgeously. According to the opinion of some authorities, Krishna was actually born as the son of Yashoda. In any case, without regard for material understandings, we can accept that Nanda Maharaj's celebration for the ceremony of Krishna's birth was proper. This ceremony is therefore well known everywhere as Nandotsava. Ah, even in ISKCON on our Vaishnava calendar, the day after Janmastami is Nandotsava. Of course, it's also the appearance day of our founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada. But the, 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 the traditional name is Nand Otsava. It was named after Nanda Maharaj. Nanda Maharaj's child. Krishna was Nanda Maharaj's child. But Nanda Maharaj is so mag magnanimous, he lets Vasudeva and Devaki get the credit. They're known more as to be Krishna's mother and father. The people of Vrindavan, however, the Bridge Basi people, if you ask them who is actually the Supreme Lord, they will tell you Nanda Papa and Yashoda. They know. The people of Vrindavan know. And Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and many other great Acharyas, they've also established that. If you read the different commentaries, you'll see they all confirm. And it's also here in Prabhupada's books. You go through it carefully, you'll see it's shown there that Actually, the real father and mother of Lord Krishna is Nanda and Yashoda. Mm -hmm. So Nanda Maharaj, uh, he is going to perform his Vedic ceremony in celebration of his wife giving birth to a child. And he, he gives charity. And it mentions what charity he gives. He's a very magnanimous personality, Nanda Maharaj. Right? You can think of some people who are very good in giving charity. Who's described in our literature? Who gives a lot of charity? Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj. Oh, yes, right. <laughs> well, yeah, the Lord came personally to get charity from him. Yeah. Anybody else? Karna. Karna. Karna, yes. Karna. Yes, he is known to be giving charity. King Nirga. Who? Nirga, Nirga, King Nirga. Yes, Nirga. Yeah, Nirga. That's a good. That's the one. He gave a lot of charity, didn't he? But he got trouble. But anyway, he was certainly giving a lot of charity. King Maruta. King. Maruta. Maruta. Okay. Yes. Oh, Ranti Dev. Oh, Ranti Dev. Ranti Dev. Yeah, he would give the food, his last food, right? He was not very wealthy, but whatever food he had, he would share, he would give it to the people who came to his home. Ranti Dev, very magnanimous. Also, we have 
Janak Maharaj, he gave a lot of charity. We have also Prithu Maharaj, he was also... But Nanda Maharaj is more magnanimous than any of them. When we read about the charity he gives, it's just overwhelming. Because remember, he's so happy. He's got the Supreme Lord as his son. So first thing he, did, he does, he gives away two million cows. And they're fully decorated with cloth and jewels in charity to the brahmanas. And then he gives also seven hills of grain. So I was reading today the commentaries, it said seven hills of sesame, actually. It said that they described it as being sesame, what he was giving. And it was covered with jewels and with cloth, decorated with golden embroidery. So the idea is the hills with the, gold, with the golden embroidery, it's like Meru Mountain. So this is the idea that he's giving away hills like Meru Mountain. So he was very, his charity is not finished yet. We're going to hear more about the charity which he gave. First of all, text number four describes why this uh, ceremony is being performed. This uh, Jatakarma ceremony, the Vedic rites, the rituals in honor of the child. Because purification, we want to get purification. Purification means getting rid of the contamination. So I'll just read it to you, text number four. O king, by the passing of time, land and other material possessions are purified. By bathing the body, by bathing the body is purified. And by being cleansed, unclean things are purified. By purificatory ceremonies, birth is purified. By austerity, the senses are purified, and by worship and charity offered to the brahmanas, material possessions are purified. By satisfaction, the mind is purified, and by self-realization or Krishna consciousness, the soul is purified. So Kadeva Goswami is describing these different processes of purifying, purificatory activities, particularly because Nanda Maharaj is doing this purification for the, the, the birth of his child, the samskars, very important. Prabhupada wanted that we should do these things. Of course, usually with the Anaprashna, that's very popular. <laughs> they like that. Once a child is born, six months old, the first grains. They bring the child and feed the first grains to the child, six months old. But here's Nanda Maharaj, he's doing this ceremony right the day of the birth of the child. And he's doing it very gorgeously also. Are any of these, method, these different processes of purification, are they attractive to you? First of I mean, maybe at the end, it mentions about by satisfaction, the mind is purified. That's a very important process, to be satisfied. Maybe you remember reading in the, in the Krishna book, the pastime of Rukmini sending a Brahmana to Dwarka. With, uh, she sent the Brahmana to Dwarka, to Lord Krishna, to tell Lord Krishna, asking Lord Krishna to come and rescue her and save her from her marriage. And how did Lord Krishna greet the Brahmana? Does anybody know? Anybody remember that section in the Krishna book? Anyway, Lord Krishna asked the Brahmana, how are you, my dear Brahmana friend? Are you peaceful? Is your mind peaceful? In other words, are you following the religious principles? Are you satisfied? We must keep our... It's, it's very important to...
to be satisfied. There was a nice devotee who used to work in the Krishna Balaram Mandir. I don't know if you remember him. He served in the Krishna Balaram Mandir for 32 years. And his name was Vibhu Chaitanya. He was an elder, uh, he passed away now in old age, but he was a, a very amazing person. Right from the opening of the temple, he came and he took on the service to cook the offerings. And he'd go in the kitchen early in the morning, like six in the morning, he'd be there till 10 at night. And he'd chant all his rounds there. He'd do all the, make all the offerings. And he was always blissful, always singing and glorifying the Lord. He was always, always satisfied. He never complained. And he did his service for so long. And devotees would go and help him. And they would just be amazed at his mood. He was so transcendental. At a certain point, he was not able to walk. And he took up another service. He took up a service of giving the Charanamrita to people in the temple room. And he'd sit in the temple and any, everyone would come and take Charanamrita and he would wash their hand for them. And then he would even dry their hands sometimes. So he was really an amazing person. His samadhi is there at the Krishna Balaram uh, and the Goshala at the back. So we have wonderful examples like that. We, we should be satisfied. Whatever we're doing, you know, be satisfied. It doesn't help to just complain. So I hope you're all satisfied. Try to keep satisfied. And what about the, the last one, that uh, by Krishna consciousness the soul is purified. Purifying, the, well of course the soul is never contaminated, the soul is always pure, but it is covered. There are coverings over the soul. And so we can purify and remove these coverings by Krishna consciousness. It's nice to study these different processes which are mentioned here. It mentions about by worship and charity offered to the brahmanas, material possessions are purified. So we have material possessions. It's good. Don't be afraid to give charity and to uh, give them to others. Don't be too much attached. If we make offerings by worship and charity offered to the brahmanas, we'll purify our possessions. Material life is very easy to get very attached. We want to be careful. So especially when the child is born, you want to also purify the child. You should, we should do this kind, this kind of ceremony. So, it's described, text number five, about what happens, about the brahmanas, how they're engaged in performing the Vedic ceremony. There's, the brahmanas are chanting Vedic hymns, so they're giving blessings. Yeah. And then you've got other people, you've got the, the suttas and the magadas and the vana, van, vanditas, the magadas, they're speaking about the history of the great dynasties in the past. And the suttas, they're speaking the Puranas. And the vanditas, they're describing about the auspicious occasion which is taking place. So you've got all these different people. You've got the brahmanas, the suttas, the magadas, and the vanditas. And they're all there, they're all reciting. And on top of that, you've got singers and different kinds of musical instruments. And it mentions some of the drums which are being played, the dundubis and the berries. Dundubis, right? One of the names of Vasudev, Anakadumbabi. Who knows the meaning? What's the meaning, Anakadumbabi? Ramakrishna Prabhu, do you know? Maybe you could help me. 
Hare Krishna Maharaj. It is said that on the auspicious occasion of the appearance of Vasudev, uh, Vasudeva, all the celestial instruments, they started to play on their own out of ecstasy because he was such a pure soul. So that's how it is referred to that he is Anakatindavi. So it, it means the, the, the drums are being played at the time of his birth? Yes. Okay, thank you. And that's Vasudev Krishna or Vasudev? It was talking about Vasudeva itself. Okay. The father of uh, Krishna. The father of Krishna, right. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. So, so you can see Nanda Maharaj really arranged a big festival. It's a big thing. So many people. The Brahmanas, all these different people, and then text 6 describes the decoration, how nicely they decorated, flower garlands everywhere, wonderful uh, different pieces of cloth, mango leaves, flags, all the, everything's very nice and everything is perfectly swept and washed with water. And then the cows and bulls are also taken care of. The cows, the bulls, the calf, they're thoroughly cleansed and smeared with a mixture of turmeric and oil, varieties of minerals. Their heads are bedecked with peacock feathers. So not only Krishna wears a peacock feather, we see the cows also decorated with peacock feathers. And they were garlanded covered with cloth and golden ornaments. So, very wonderful taking care of the cows. They really knew how to do it because, of course, they have so many cows. And so they want to keep them happy. It's a very important part. And then the cowherd men come and they are dressed also very nicely and they come with valuable ornaments and, and garlands such as coats and turbans or garments, garments such as coats and turbans and described also, they brought also valuable jewels with them. They were giving like, chat. they wanted to give jewels to Nanda Maharaj or in honour of the child, the birth of the child. So they were dressed very opulently, not like Prabhupada remarks, you know, nowadays you see the people in the villages, you know, and Nandagram and like that, you know, that they dress in a ragged way. But in the times of Lord Krishna, they were dressed very nicely. Of course, 5,000 years ago, everybody lived in the villages. Just like here in Mayapur, when we go on Parikrama, we go to the different places in the, in the outskirts of Navadweep Dam, and we see there are big houses there, where in the past people used to live. But they've all gone. Where did they go? Oh, they went to Calcutta, oh, they went to Bombay, oh, they went to Delhi, like that. They've all moved out. They all went to the cities. So the the... People left in the villages are just like sometimes children and the older people. And you find the young people all go to the big city to live in the city. So in this way the village life went down. But 5,000 years ago in the time of Lord Krishna was very opulent. And the people were very wealthy and opulent. They lived very nicely. Then the ladies are described, the gopis. The gopis are also very joyful because Mother Yashoda has given birth to a male child. Even though she's not a young woman, she gave birth to a male child. So the, the, all the people in Goku, they all feel so happy, they're so joyful about it. And the ladies are described, right? How are the ladies described there in Vrindavan? Are they healthy? Are they good looking? They're very attractive. They're described. They're described that how they dressed, they, 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 they had ornaments and ointment around the eyes and so on. 
then it's described also that they had full hips and full breasts and so they were very healthy they were they were very uh, attractive women and they were not dressed in rags they were very nicely dressed and decorated So they all come to see Mother Yashoda and they, they bring presentations in their hands. And in their hands, they bring presentations, actually they bring it on gold plates. It's interesting, you know, Bangladesh also, although we think of Bangladesh as being a poor country, there are many, actually, many Bengalis from Bangladesh, they're working in out of Bangladesh. They work out of Bangladesh, they go to places like Singapore and work there and they send the money back to Bangladesh. So you go to Bangladesh, you think Bangladesh is poor, but when you see the ladies, they all come with so much jewelry. They have so many, so many jewels, so much gold, so many nice necklaces and rings and so on. So they're not poor at all. Of course, their husbands are away from home, working there and sending the money home to them. So that's not how it was 5,000 years ago. 5,000 years ago, the men were at home. And Mother Yashoda, she's there with her child. And all the ladies, they want to, they're also very joyful. The, the ladies are more happy than the men. You know, naturally, when a child is born, the, the, the men, they don't worry very much about the child, <laughs> not a very big thing, not very exciting for them. But for the ladies, oh, it's a very big thing. When a little child will come in, a little child will walk into the room and you see all the ladies immediately, the, the, the little child will get the attention of all the ladies. The men, you know, we men, we just sit there, we don't worry about, but the ladies, they're all drawn to the child. So here also in Vrindavan, with the birth of Krishna, it's really, the ladies, they're really enjoying, they're really happy about that, and they've come to take part in the birth celebration. The wives of the cowherd men. And we see these ladies, how they're so healthy. You know, people in the city, they're so unhealthy. People in the city, they don't, they, don't, they don't get much work. I remember some time ago, I, I was teaching yoga some time ago, and uh, the pe sometimes you get people come to the class, you know, they're women, and they don't get, they can't, they can hardly sit down. They don't get much exercise, so they come to the yoga class. And why don't they get much exercise? because they have a maid at home, and the maid does everything for them. The maid does all the laundry. The maid does all the bending and the cleaning and so on, and they don't do anything. And so then they need exercise, they come to the yoga class. <laughs> Nowadays, everything is made easy. Washing machines, put everything in the washing machine. Nobody wants to bend down and wring out the clothes and do these things. We get machines to do everything. The grinding of spices used to be done by hand. Nowadays it's all done by machines. Everything is like, get machines to do it. Everybody agree? Any comments? No comments. Ladies, what do you say ladies? All right. Anyway, so no comments. No. So, oh, Guru, I, I can make a little comment. Okay, please. Yeah. Because I used to read one book about Ayurveda, and I find out it's very interesting. All kinds of positions when we are doing, like uh, they're all called yoga asanas, and it is very beneficial to both of our mind and our bodies. But nowadays we lost that kind of opportunity. Just like you mentioned, we, we have washing machine, we have so many other machines to do those. And some people, they have maids. So we don't get the chance. And then we don't have that kind of satisfaction. 
I read that book is very interesting. Like if you are picking up fruits or collecting some grains from the field, that would make you have a kind of satisfactory feelings. But now nowadays we lost everything: mental health and physical health. Yeah. Hi, Krishna. Thank you. Thank you for your support. <laughs> uh, by the same way, I, I feel even for the male, like uh, generally uh, the Vaishyas, uh, they will be tilling the land, taking care of cows and things like that. Yes. It was there was quite a quite a bit of a physical labor even for the male, but now like uh, generally we see, especially in cities, they would rather prefer to drive. Two yes. kilometers one way and coming back two kilometers driving. Yes. And then this office work they're sitting there. So then it's not just the female but the male. We see they have got fat bellies. Yes. And then they have got various diseases like diabetes. Yes. And all the spinal cord problems. <laughs> sitting with the computer all day long. Right. That's right, Prabhu. You've got it down. <laughs> you see the problems. Yeah. We see the problem. It's difficult to get the solution. You know how to get away from it. To break the, you know, we're so dependent on these things. Yes, they have things like office yoga, of course, try to get people to do yoga. But it's very true, you know, you, you, every, every, you just drive everywhere, nobody wants to walk, you know. Go upstairs, where's the lift? Nobody can climb the stairs, you need a lift or escalator or something, all right? so. Okay, go ahead, text 11. We read about the decoration of the gopis. Very beautiful. Now, while going to the house of Nanda Maharaj, the gopis, their earrings, breasts and garlands moving were brilliantly beautiful. Okay, so Sukadev Goswami is really appreciating the condition of these gopis. Describe them twice mentioned about how they're beautiful and how they're so decorated, their hands with bangles, their dresses, colors, and their hair with flowers. So nice, wonderful. And then Prabhupada quotes from the Brahma Samhita, who are these gopis? They're not ordinary ladies. These gopis are not ordinary. They are all expansions of Krishna's pleasure potency, right? And the verses there in the Brahma Samhita, Ananda Chinmaya Rasa Pratibhavitabhis, right? Like that. And Chintamani Prakarat, these things. The goddesses of fortune are all there in the home of Nanda Maharaj in Vrindavan. These ladies, these cowherd ladies who have come there to be with Krishna, to take part in his pastimes. I was reading today also, it said that. Some gopis actually, usually the gopis are younger. We, we, and according to our calendar, Srimati Radharani comes after Lord Krishna. But there are some other literatures like the Garga Samhita and another one, we're saying Srimati Radharani comes before Krishna. <laughs> so the different opinions. Anyway, some gopis, younger gopis, usually they're younger than the cowherd boys. Balaram comes first and then Krishna and then Srimati Radharani comes, according to our teachings. Okay, so then that we hear text number 12, they give, they give their blessings. May you become the king of Braja and long maintain all its habit inhabitants. So this way Krishna was blessed. The wives and daughters, they said like that, they give their blessings to the child. They sprinkled turmeric powder, oil and water over the, the Supreme Lord, over the birthless Supreme Lord and offered their prayers. Very wonderful, get the blessings like that. Now one, one other thing, why did Nanda Maharaj give so much charity? What, what was it? What, well, we mentioned purify, he gets, he gets purified, but what was his reason actually in giving charity? Nanda Maharaj is not thinking about his purification. Why did he give so much charity? Does anybody know? Ramakrishna Prabhu? Hello, <coughs> Maharaj. Yes, 
this the exorcist. You were referring to like what you did. Nanda Maharaj gave so much of uh, uh, charity. Yes. Uh, not only that, he was extremely happy, and uh, because the Lord also inspires uh, his pure devotee, and that's the reciprocation that he does with all the level living entities to whom he is so dear, especially the Rajavasis who are such pure devotees of the Lord. Yes, he, that's right. He, Nanda Maharaj knows that if he pleases the devotees, then Lord Vishnu will be pleased. Lord Vishnu will be satisfied. If the devotees are satisfied, then Lord Vishnu will also be satisfied. And if Lord Vishnu is satisfied, then he will bless his son. So Nanda Maharaj is thinking, because he's a father, he's worried about his son, he wants to get protection for his son. This, this uh, birth ceremony which he's doing, this is to create auspiciousness for his son, that his son will be protected, that he, he, <coughs> he will be protected from all the inauspiciousness of the world. And so by giving charity in this way, he is able to get the blessings of Lord Vishnu. We get the blessings of Lord Vishnu by pleasing Lord Vishnu's devotees. So serving the, the Vaishnavas is very powerful. Nandamar is described in the commentaries of the Acharya how Nandamaraj gave so much charity. And it wasn't just what he wanted to give. He would people would, whatever they wanted, he would give them. They could ask for anything and he would give them. And they were giving so much charity. So everyone, according to their caste and position, of course, they'd be provided for. Everything was done very nicely. So it said, Nanda Maharaj's charity was even greater than these people like you were mentioning Maharaj Nriga and kings like Janaka and other. How is it possible Nanda Maharaj, a mere cowherd man, could do that? How could he get so much opulence to give away so many cows and to give so much charity? Would anybody like to explain that? We should understand how Nanda Maharaj could give so much charity. Um. Maharaj, yes, Prabhu. As uh, we see in Prabhupada speaking the purpose, because uh, Nanda Maharaj being a Vaishya, they were uh, executing their own religious uh, duty, which is like agriculture, cow protection, things like that. Hence, they were very opulent. So, like if you are executing your 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 prescribed duties, so then you are opulent. So then that Prabhupada is talking about all the agricultures of the past India and how they were very opulent as compared and these contrasting it with the present condition. They hardly have many, I mean, we see in, in current India, many farmers are uh, forced to commit suicide because they can't pay off the debts and things like that. So then there is a clear, clear contrast. You don't follow the prescribed duty. So then as a result, you become poor. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Actually, it's, it's true what you say, but th there's a higher reason also, because, you know, to give the kind of charity which Nanda Maharaj was giving, it's not that, you know, it can just be any, just, just be a Vaishya and just give that, because it was so great, his charity was so great. Because, how could he do it? Because the Supreme Lord is his son. And because Krishna is his son, so, all the blessings of the goddess of fortune are there. And remember also, Nanda Maharaj is not in any ordinary place. He's in Braja, right? And what is the nature of Braja? We think of Braja as being some, you know, we think of, it, oh, it's poor. No way, right? It may, we look with our material eyes, we don't understand the real opulence which is there in Braja. The trees are all Kalpa Briksha, the cows are all Surabi cows, and the dust of the dam is Chintamani. 
So where is the question of poverty in Vrindavan? So Nanda Maharaj, he was the most opulent person. And he could give opulence greater than even the King of Heaven. And or Kuvera or any of these people, none of them could match him. The opulence, the charity which he would give. And it was all possible because of the grace of Krishna in the holy land of Braja. Okay. Maharaj? Yes? Then all the Rajavasis are also should be opulent. Then to whom he has given? Then everybody should have the same opulence. Well, remember, you see, not everybody, just because they're, Vrindavan is not just a place on the map. You know, the, who is actually a bridge basi? It's not just living there in Vrindavan. You have to have also the consciousness. You have to be in pure consciousness. We're, and we're talking about 5,000 years ago when Lord Krishna was personally present on the planet. So with Lord Krishna personally there, then certainly that will remove all the things which were lacking. There'd be nothing lacking, no scarcity of anything because Lord Krishna has personally come there. There's no question of scarcity. Raj, in, also in uh, Gopi Gita, the, the first uh, verse, first text, the Gopis sing that since we have taken birth, it appears that Lakshmi has been residing in Raja forever. Right. Jayati Tetikam Janmana Braja Shayata Indira Shasvadatati. Right? Indira. Right? So Lakshmi has come to reside in Braja. Definitely, because Lord Krishna is there. So Lakshmi resides also in Braja. So Certainly in the, times of Ch in the times of Lord Krishna, there was no scarcity 5,000 years ago. So Vrindavan is a holy place. We have to properly honour it. And then Lord Krishna reveals the nature of the Dham. And we see how the Goswamis lived there. The Goswamis lived there and they lived very simply, but they were able to build such big temples. How were they able to build such big temples? Radha Govinda. Radha Madan Mohan, these huge temples, amazing temples. Krishna arranges. Krishna sent people. Of course, they don't care. They're not anxious for their maintenance. They can live very simply. And the Bridge Basi people also, they don't worry. Although everything is Chintamani, they don't think of sense gratification. The bridge basi people, they don't want anything from the surabi cow or from the kalpa bridge. They just simply want flowers and milk to worship Krishna. They're only thinking of the worship of Krishna. They don't think about sense gratification for their tongue or for their bodies. So that's the nature of these damvasis. Actually damvasis, those who are actually damvasis, they're like that. Guru Maharaj, can I add a little comment? Okay. According to Sanatan Goswami, he had a uh, he had a analysis of purports to verse number sixteen. I think that one give a little hint of uh, Srinivas Gopal Prabhu's question. He mentioned that he gave cloth and other items such as go to the covered men, and women to the bars, the singers and musicians who made their living by their skills, and. Actually, whatever he's giving to them has two kinds of meanings. In one, on the one hand, he, he's giving them, he knows uh, what they desired most or what was known as the most excellent. Another layer of meaning is, or he gave not only to those who made a living by their skills, like the singers, the reciters, but also to the most unfortunate. Shall we understand this most unfortunate, maybe because of past time, so they appeared like um, most unfortunate? Because as you mentioned in Vraja, when Krishna appeared, it's not possible that they are lacking of anything. And also in Prabhupada's 
purport and also the text in verse number 18, we can see that beginning from Lord Krishna's appearance there, it became the place for the pastimes of the goddess of fortune. So if so, and the, the last sentence of the purport says, Manamaha's abode was already opulent. And since Krishna had appeared, it would be opulent in all respects. Okay, thank you. Yes. And also I want to add only one minute, because when I was reading Sanatana Goswami's commentary, I feel it's so amazing. It mentions that Nanda Mahaji prepared the, um, the green mountains and the sesame mountains. And there's a, the, a very short description of the green mountains. He said, Meru mountain of rice in the middle should be decorated with three gold, gold trees. In the east should be pearls and diam diamonds. In the south should be garnet, gomedas. It's like pomegranate stone. And the yellow sapphires in the west should be emeralds and sapphires. And in the north should be cat's eye gems and rubies. And there also should be a deity of Vishnu, like the sun, made of gold. And there should also be uh, also different color of cloth. And anyways, so opulent. <laughs> when I read, I just feel amazed. Yes, yeah, that's right. I want to understand the opulence of Nanda Maharaj. <laughs> He's certainly not an ordinary person. And he's so magnanimous. You know, he, an el elderly man, and his, his, his wife, they were given a son. People were thinking that they didn't want a son because they thought, oh, they're already old, they won't want children now. But when they were blessed with a son, he was actually very, very happy. And he thought, this is really wonderful and is so happy to give charity because this is how he pleases Lord Vishnu. He pleases the devotees, you satisfy the devotees, and by satisfying the devotees, Lord Vishnu himself is satisfied. And when Lord Vishnu is satisfied, then his son will be safe. So Nanda Maharaj is thinking like a real father, he's thinking of the welfare of his son and he wants to do everything for protection. And now, there's a beautiful description about how opulent it is in text 14. Jalangi jumped ahead a bit. I want to go back. We didn't cover text 14 because it talks about the mood of the festival and how they're enjoying and they're splashing one another with a mixture of curd, condensed milk, butter and water. And they threw butter on one another and smeared it on one another's bodies. And in other commentaries it describes how they would slip because the ground would be covered with the butter and the ghee. And they would slip and fall down. And then their whole bodies would be covered in the butter and the yogurt and the ghee. And, uh, and they, when they tried to get up, they'd fall down again because the ground was so slippy. And this way they were, they were really laughing, they were having a wonderful time, everybody was enjoying. Just imagine how opulent it was. The, even the, the drain, the drains were blocked. But you know, when we get blocked drains, it's not, it's not like they're blocked. Their drains were blocked with ghee and butter and yogurt and things. Our drains get blocked with all the garbage and dirty water. It's such a difference. So it was really a festival. They were having a, a very nice festival. Everyone's very happy. And they had so much milk. There was so much milk, everybody could enjoy. They were throwing it, you know, bowls of cheese and condensed milk. Could you imagine it? Oh my goodness, people would go crazy, right? Just to get these things. Just like sometimes we throw these things and people will rush to get it. So, this was the opulence 5,000 years ago. How wonderful it was all taking place there. And then text, text number 15, 16 describes, Nanda Maharaj gave clothing, ornaments and cows in charity to the cowherd man. Previously he was giving to the brahmanas. Now he's giving to the cowherd man in order to please Lord Vishnu. And thus he improved the condition of his own son in all respects. 
he distributed charity to the suttas. Remember the suttas? They're reciting the Puranas. And then the Magadhas, and they're reciting about the glories of the previous dynasties. And the Vandis, they're glorifying the occasion. And then others, other professions, according to their educational qualification, he satisfied everyone's desires. Everyone should be happy. That's, what, that's a festival, right? Everyone's happy, enjoying. So this is Nandotsava. This is the original Nandotsava, 5,000 years ago. How wonderful. <laughs> and Prabhupada, in the purport, Prabhupada quotes the verse about how worship of my devotee is better Lord Krishna says, worship of my devotee is better than worshipping me directly. So this is the principle in giving charity. You give charity, you satisfy the devotees, and Lord Vishnu is also happy when he sees that devotees are happy. Sometimes we would go to uh, temple. I remember once I was in Tirupati, and I was in, we were staying at Hatiram Swami's ashram. Hatiram Swami is famous there. They actually cook the Mongol Arti sweets every morning for Mongol Arti. So they were doing a yagya and we, we attended. And they came and they gave everybody present, they gave everyone charity. You know, they didn't give a lot, you know, but they gave some money. They gave coins or gold coins or something or money like that. It, it's a custom. It's satisfy the devotees. Another time, in Vrindavan, there was a disciple of His Holiness Giri Swami, and she was leaving her body. She had cancer, and at that time she didn't have long left. And so there was a yagya arranged, and devotees were invited, and she gave charity to everyone present. She wanted to satisfy everyone. So it's very nice. That's the principle. Get the blessings of the devotees. By the blessings of the devotees, she get the blessing of Krishna. All right, we'll take a break. Ten minutes. Please, have a break. Recording stopped. Nanda Maharaj giving charity and how he satisfied everyone. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes? Maharaj, I have a question on verse 12. Verse 12. Yes. Okay. What uh, the, in the translation it says uh, all the Rajivasis offered blessings, blessings to Lord Krishna that he becomes the king of Raja and long maintain all his inhabitants. However, we see that uh, Krishna is um, actually he goes out of Raja when he was young itself and he does not rule Raja later on, right? He basically moves to uh, Dvaraka. So, um, his devotees normally, whatever they say, he makes it true. How do we understand in this case, uh, um, like how he makes their words true, like their blessings? Yes. Well, Lord Krishna resides eternally in Braja. What happened was, when Akrura came to take Lord Krishna to Mathura, he takes the uh, Vasudev Krishna to Mathura. And the Shamsundar Krishna, he stayed in Braja. He didn't leave Braja. So he stayed there. So the blessing was in time. Lord Krishna never leaves Vrindavan. He eternally resides there. And 5,000 years ago, when Akrura came, to take Krishna to Mathura. At that time, they stopped to take bath, you know, at the Akrura gut. And at that point, Vasudev Krishna went on to Mathura and Shamsundra Krishna stayed in Vrindavan. And it said actually he hid, he hid himself in the hearts of the gopis. So that's how we understand that the, the, the the blessings was intact. Lord Krishna certainly is the king of Braja, he's eternally the king of Braja, 
and he resides there eternally. This man, thank you. He not only resides in Braja, he also resides in Mathura and Dwarka. Okay, so, so some, of course, how do we understand? So, sometimes Krishna's manifest and sometimes unmanifest. Sometimes he's prakat, sometimes he's aprakat. Just Prabhupada gives the example, he just like clouds. Sometimes they're there in the sky, other times they're not there. But they're still there, but they're just not manifest. So Krishna is like that. Sometimes he manifests, like 5,000 years ago, he was manifest for his pastime. Now, at this time, he's not, he's in his apricot form there in Vrindavan. Hare Prabhu. Thank you. Guru Maharaj, I, I remember one incident related to Govardhan and related to Nadia Vihari Prabhu's question. So after Go, uh, after this Indra, was, his pride was defeated by Lord Krishna. And then actually in Govinda Kund, he, he, bring, uh, he brought a Surabi cow and gave Abhishek to Krishna and actually established him as a king of Braj. Shall we understand like that? Yes, if you like, you can understand like that. Yes, because he said, he said, told Lord Krishna, actually, you're the real Indra. Indra means king. So Indra, you know, he'd become proud and Lord Krishna had humbled him. So Indra came to offer, to, to apologize to Lord Krishna. And so at that time, Indra, as you said, he did, they did Abhishek, Mother Surabi and Indra, they both did Abhishek of Lord Krishna. At that time, Indra also told Lord Krishna, you are actually Indra. You're the real Indra. <laughs> okay. Maharaj, can I ask one question, Maharaj? Yes. Uh, Maharaj, generally when we hear our description of the residents of Vrindavan, even the animals, it is said that even the animals residing there are seen having 400 forms by the demigods. So, we see, uh, it is said, and Prabhupada also says that those who have two offenses in Vrindavan, they become monkeys there. And later on, uh, they are purified and they will go back home back to Godhead. But what about the residents of the Vrindavan? Miss, I am talking about currently those who are residing there. So those things are not like very clearly given. So I wanted to know about them. Well, it will depend on them. What is their mood? And how are they? You know, actually, generally, we see the people of Vrindavan, they're very, very pious and very devoted. Of course, they work all day, but, you know, that's not a barrier. Just like the gopis, they were working all the time, but their hearts were always on Krishna. They were always thinking of Krishna and waiting for, they'd watch Krishna go off in the morning, they'd see Krishna come, wait for Krishna to come home at night. But all day they're working. And they're chanting and singing songs about Krishna. So they were always in Krishna consciousness. So you're asking about the people of Vrindavan. I, I, I know we have, there's one devotee from the UK, Parasuram Prabhu, and he goes, he would go to Vrindavan and he'd, he'd get a bullock cart and he'd take his bullock cart around Braja and they'd go to the villages in Braja. And every night they'd have huge kirtan and all these bridge basi people would come and they'd love, they'd just do, they'd do wonderful kirtan and they would chant like anything. They were wonderful devotees. He, he would tell me, I never got the chance to actually go, but he would tell me about it. He says, so amazing how all these people in Vrindavan, they're so wonderful. They love kirtan, they love chanting. They're really natural devotees. Indra Dumna Swami told about, he went to this uh, temple, Dauji. You know Dauji in Vrindavan? The temple of Dauji? So he went there to Dauji and there was this young girl there and he was talking to her and he was asking her, do you want to come to the West with me? She said, no, 
I'm not going to leave Daoji. I'm, I want to be here with Daoji. I'm, I don't want to leave Daoji. So even though a young girl, but she had so deep attachment for Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram, mm -hmm. like that. Though the residents of the Holy Dham, the Dham Vasis, are very, very special people. So we're taught that's the first offense in living in the Dham, to respect all the inhabitants of the Dham, no matter who they are. Even the trees and the birds, the pigs, the dogs. <laughs> I, I, I was hearing, uh, it's mentioned also in, in Venu Gita, in 10th Canto, Venu Gita, it t tells about the birds in the Dham. They're great sages who come. They're great sages, they're, they're not ordinary birds, but they're great sages who come in the Dham to be in Vrindavan Dham. So all of these different living entities in the Holy Dham, they're very special. We cannot understand very well their actual position, but they are very, very special. Okay, Prabhupada did say something about uh, the hogs. He said they were, that they did some offense, they were yogis, but he said they'll take birth. They said, well, this will be the last birth, next birth they'll go back to God, eh? finish off their karma. People didn't like it though, Bridge Basi people didn't like to hear that. Some of the people, some of the, like the, 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 the caste Brahmins there. So we have to be careful what we preach in Vrindavan. We have to be careful. Prabhupada could say these things. We cannot. Okay. okay I want to add on this, if with your permission. Yes, Prabhu, please. Maharaj, once uh, there was Yatra by Radhanath Swami Maharaj, about 200 devotees. Yes. And they were in, they were in Kucha Gaon. I think a village of Lalita or Vishakha, one of the Sakhis. And somehow they had no access. Lalita Shakti house. Lalita Shakti, okay. Somehow they had no access to prasadam. So they, they approached the villagers and within one hour, 10, 15 families came together and served a, a full meal to our 200 devotees, our 200 devotees. And on top of that, they were, they were also refusing to take money for that. They said, no, you are our guest, you are in Vrindavan, please accept this as our offering. Oh. Wonderful. Amazing. Yeah, where could you get that kind of etiquette? Only in the dawn. Very special. Thank you, Prabhu. Very nice. Yes, yeah, some people sometimes wonder, you know, that oh, 5,000 years ago, people in the dawn, they're special, but what about today? Are they still special? Yeah, they're still very special people. The dawn is still the dawn. And the Damvasis are not ordinary people. Okay. We'll go ahead. So Nanda Maharaj satisfied everyone. And you see in the purport, Prabhupada writes about satisfying Vishnu. Prabhupada writes at the end of the purport, Nanda Maharaj wanted to see his newborn child happy. That was his purpose. Therefore, he wanted to satisfy Lord Vishnu. And to satisfy Lord Vishnu, it was necessary to satisfy his devotees, such as the learned Brahmanas, Mogadas, and Suttas. Thus, in a roundabout way, ultimately, it was Lord Vishnu who was to be satisfied. Right? Satisfy the devotees, satisfy Vishnu. And then next we hear about Mother Rohini. Now, Mother Rohini, of course, the mother of Balaram, she's also in the home of Nanda Maharaj. And it's described, she is the most fortunate. She's described, Mahabhaga. Why, why is she so fortunate? Why is she Mahabhaga? Among all the uh, Vasudeva's wives, she would only stay in uh, uh, Vrindavan. Yes. And what's special about that? Because she can raise Krishna and Balaram together. 
that she can witness. She also, she also received uh, Supreme Lord as his Shri She Hassan. received all the guests in the ceremony and thus celebrated Janmashtami, the first Janmashtami. Yes, yeah, she's celebrating the birth ceremony. She's also happy. Nanda Maharaj gave her new clothes and ornaments because he was worried, you know, she will feel a bit morose because her husband's not there. She's separated from her husband for a long time. Of course, Vasudev had several wives, but she was one of them. And uh, Nanda Maharaj was taking care of her and she delivered Balaram there. And Balaram was being raised. So the two mothers, Mother Yashoda and Rohini, they're both there. So Rohini is Mahabhaga because she's there in Vrindavan and she can witness all the childhood Leela of Krishna and Balaram. She's so fortunate. She's seeing Lord Krishna crawl in the courtyard of Nanda Maharaj. So later on we hear that after Lord Krishna grew up a bit and gone to Dwarka, then Lord Krishna was, was speaking the names of different gopis and different people who people in Dwarka didn't know. And they wondered who are all these people. And it was only Mother Rohini who knew. So they asked Rohini, please tell us about Lord Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. Right, Srinivas? Yes? Tell us Krishna. about Lord Krishna in Vrindavan. Rohini was asked by the people in Dwarka, tell us about Lord Krishna in Vrindavan. And what happened? Mm. So in Dwarka, they asked, right? Yeah. Krishna had grown Jaranath, up. The, he'd gone... Lila. Yes, right. That's when, that's when Krishna and Balaram Subhadra came in the back and they were hearing and their arms shrunk into their legs and their eyes dilated. And this was Jagannath Leela. Rohini was describing. They were, they were hearing Rohini speak the pastimes of Lord Krishna in Vrindavan. So amazing. So Rohini was so fortunate. Although we would think she's unfortunate. Actually, she was so fortunate because she got the Lord as her son and then she got to live with them in Vrindavan. And then she went to Dwarka and she lived with them there also. So she was really fortunate. Okay, so then text 18, O Maharaj Parikshit, the home of Nanda Maharaj is eternally the abode of this, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Eternally! The Lord eternally resides in the home of Nanda Maharaj. We go to Nanda Gram. The Lord is residing there. We may not see him with our material eyes, but he's there. His transcendental qualities and is therefore always naturally endowed with the opulence of all wealth. Yet beginning from Krishna's appearance there, it became the place for the pastimes of the goddess of fortune. And the goddess of fortune we call Rama Devi, right? The Vishnu is called Krishna and Radha is called Rama. Rama, Rama Devi, the goddess of fortune, or the, the, the goddesses of fortune. There, there are many Ramas, but there's one supreme goddess of fortune. And that is Srimati Radharani. And Prabhupada writes about that there. He said that Radharani would also appear there very soon. Nanda Maharaj's abode was already opulent. And since Krishna had appeared, it would be opulent in all respects. All right? I was telling, the other day I was telling you like, Somebody asked Tamal Krishna Maharaj, is this person, there was this South Indian guru, people were saying he's an avatar, he's God. And they asked Tamal Krishna Maharaj, he said, well, if he was God, why is the world so poor? If, the, if God is actually present on the planet, the world will be opulent. And it was when Lord Krishna appeared. Well, certainly Vrindavan, that area was very opulent because the goddess of fortune comes and she bestows her blessings there. 
wherever Lord Krishna resides. And he resides there eternally. So Nanda Maharaj then appoints the local cowherd men to protect Gokul and then went to Mathura to pay the yearly taxes to King Kamsa. So Nanda Maharaj, remember previously, he didn't have a son. He didn't have a child. So when the, when the man doesn't have a child, he doesn't worry very much. He's not thinking about, you know, position, he's not worried about money and so on. Because no child, no children, no family, he only has his wife only, so he doesn't worry very much, he's not very uh, possessive. But after you get a child, it's like, you know, it's, it's like you become like a person with four legs. <laughs> you become four legs. You get another child, you get six, it's like six legs. You, you, you become more and more possessive. So Nanda Maharaj, he got the one son. So he was thinking about his situation and he knew about King Kamsa, he knew what an evil person Kamsa was. Everybody knew about that, what kind of person Kamsa is. So Nanda Maharaj decides that he doesn't want any trouble, so he went off to Mathura to pay his taxes. Because he thought, if I go and pay the taxes, then there, there won't be any problem. And he even took some offerings as well to give. He, he was a very generous person. So he, he left all the local men, the cowherd men, the gopas, to protect Goku. And he went off to Mathura to pay his taxes to King Kamsa. You know, we always hear about people, tax evaders in India, very common, right? The tax men come and they'll raid and go through the person's accounts and check all the money. They want to see what the person's doing with all his money. So, Thura, to pay his taxes. Uh, annual taxes. Again, again, his thinking in paying the taxes is to protect his child. He's not thinking about anything else. Nanda Maharaj is fully in this Vatsalya Ras and he just wants to protect his child. So he goes to Mathura, he's thinking, if I pay Kamsa his taxes, because he'd heard, he may, he may have heard that Kamsa had ordered his he had ordered go around, that they were going to go around and kill all the young babies, kill all the children ten days old and younger. So he, he may he be worried that we want to protect our children. Of course, Nanda Maharaj is in Goku, so he's, he's not going to get any harm. The Lord is there as his child. No, they're, they're not going to be able to do any harm. But Nanda Maharaj is not thinking he's God. Nanda Maharaj doesn't think Krishna is God. Vasudev, he was thinking that Krishna is my son. At the same time, he knows he's God. So Vasudev and Devaki, they thought like that. But Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, they can never think like that. They only think he's our son. And they didn't know Krishna had been, you know, the one Krishna had been taken by Vasudev, Vasudev had come and brought Vasudev Krishna there and merged with the Shamsundar Krishna. This was not known to Nanda Maharaj. So when Nanda Maharaj was in Mathura, Vasudev heard that his friend and brother had come there and that he'd already paid the taxes and he went to, so he went to meet Nanda Maharaj. He went to the residence of Nanda Maharaj. So when the two meet, who should offer respect to who? Vasudev should offer respect to Nanda because Nanda is more elder. Well, we could argue against that. We, we could say, 
Nanda should offer respect to Vasudev because Vasudev is a higher caste. Vasudev is Kshatriya and Nanda Maharaj is Vaishya. So Vasudev is a higher caste. So who should offer respect to who? Certainly what you say is true. Nanda Maharaj is elderly, older than Vasudev in age, but Vasudev has the higher caste. So, is that, what are you going to do in that situation? But he is receiving a guest, so Vasudeva has to give respect first time. Well, it's, it's Actually, Nanda... Actually, Vasudeva went to his house. Yeah, it's Nanda Maharaj's Nanda house. house. Vasudeva went to Nanda Maharaj's house. Nanda Maharaj, Vasudeva's a guest. It's Nanda Maharaj's residence where Nanda he Maharaj was... should offer respect to Vasudev because mm -hmm. the Ashrama yes. position is, is considered more important than the seniority by GH, mm -hmm. at least during the previous yuga. In the previous yuga, it was like that, yes. The caste was important. Brahmana is young, but uh, Shatriya is older, then the Brahmana gets respect from the older Shatriya. So the same principle should apply here also. <coughs> Brahmana, even the, young, even the young Brahmana gets respect from the older Brahmana. Right, we see, we see, you know, generally, even a young, you know, they have young monks. Some, you go to a Buddhist country like Thailand, and they have young monks, they have these very young boys, monks. And people will come, they will respect them, because they're monks. They're very young. But the older people will come and bow to them and bring their offerings and so on. They're just children, actually. But they're respected. Just like, and they, they even they address them as Prabud, Prabud, meaning God, the God Buddha, the Buddha God, <laughs> the, the great, the Buddha monk. Although they're little children, they address them the same as they address the older person. So age is not so important, but the caste, that social position, that's the important thing in the, in the Vedic culture. But Nanda Maharaj, he doesn't do it. He, he doesn't offer respect to Vasudev. One reason was, well, one reason he was just overwhelmed with, with happiness, just seeing Vasudev, that he was so happy that he, he was just overwhelmed. Nice. Yes? this and I'd like to I mean, know your reaction from that. Uh, it is stated that like in the purpose that uh, Nanda and uh, Vasudev in a way they were brothers. They were like very close friends. Yes. So um, like when they're like, like when they're like friends, generally friends we, can, we understand it to be of equal status or stature, then you are not like so much like, uh, I mean, uh, we are not so much, we don't so much consider that kind of uh, hierarchy when friends like that generally uh, kind of uh, dulls the difference between uh, the senior or junior or the varnashram because when you're friends, friends meet like, like to take each other on an equal I mean, footing. That's right. Yes, that's So then how do in such cases, just like we see in day-to-day -day affairs in ESCON also, like friends, like that's uh, for the third person that may be uh, somebody senior, somebody is junior, but and they're like friends, it's a little different. And uh, so what are, what are your thoughts on it, Maharaj? Yes, well, everything, time, place, circumstances, you have to, what is the relationship to them? You know, different kinds of friendship is there. What kind of friendship do you have? Is it friendship like Krishna and Uddhava? Or is it friendship like Krishna and Arjuna? And the, or Krishna and the cowherd boys? There's different types of friendship, isn't there? So different levels of relating to each other. We have to consider everything in the proper manner. Uh, but as you, as you said, you know, the, the friendship, because, so, so because of friendship, Nanda Maharaj was overwhelmed with love because they were actually like brothers. They were from the, you know, the, different, the same grandfather, 
but different mothers, di different mothers. Different. Yes, Tulangi? Guru Maharaj, my, my question is, it seems like here the Varna and the Ashram are not considered because we can see from the purport of the next verse, um, Prabhupada said Nanda Maharaj was older than Vasudeva, therefore Nanda Maharaj embraced him and Vasudeva offered him Namaskar. And um, when I read Sanatan Goswami's commentary and also Jiva um, Goswami's commentary in the same verse, they mentioned two reasons. They said Nanda did not prostrate himself before Vasudeva because he was elder than Vasudeva. And then, or he did not offer prostrations because he was overcome with prema. So the second reason, as you related, but the first reason seemed they, they are not considering the varna or ashram, only the age. Yeah. Well, of, of course, physically, you know, as you get older, it's not so easy for people to bow down. There are many elderly people, they're not able to bow down. And it's not necessarily the custom among people. Not everyone will bow down, you know. These are brothers, you know, to bow down to your brother, that's a bit unusual. But he embraced, he embraced him. So the brotherly affection is there. So that is nice. You know, it's not like they're members of a society and you have to bow down, you know. <laughs> you know not, not like that, you know. They're brothers, so he, he was showing brotherly affection by embracing him. And at the same time, Vasudeva is respectful. You know, he's appreciating Nanda Maharaj, an older person, on his, is honouring him. And he also knows, of course, Vasudeva also knows that Nanda Maharaj is taking care of his son, who is God. So, so he's really honoring, he's really respecting him. He knows, he knows he's got my son. He does, Nanda Maharaj doesn't know it, but Vasudev knows that he's got my son there and my son is the personality of Godhead. So he, he, he's certainly going to respect him, take, give him good honor. Thank you, Nanda Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu? Uh, but how did Nanda, how did uh, Vasudev go visit Nanda Maharaj if he was in the prison? How did Nanda Maharaj go to visit? Vasudev. How did Vasudev go see Nanda Maharaj if he was in prison? No, but remember, they got, they got released, remember, when, when the Durga rose up in the sky and said, you're such a fool, that this child who's going to kill you is already born some other place. So at that time, Kamsa had a change of heart. He became repentant and he let Vasudev and Devaki free. He took their shackles off and he begged them to forgive him. And he let them, he gave them freedom and he apologized to them for killing their children. You don't remember that? Yeah, yes, yes, thank it's, you. It's in the earlier yeah. chapter, I think it's chapter three. Oh, chapter, oh no, chapter four, Atrocities of Kamsa. Like that? Yeah, they got some Kamsa personally released them from the prison. Later on, he'll put them back in prison again. <laughs> but for now, they're free. Okay? Raj. Yes? Uh, again, when they meet in the Kurukshetra, it comes in chapter 81. There also, uh, Vasudev embraces Nanda Maharaj. There is no mention of offering obeisances to each other. We just embrace each other. Okay. Yes. But of course, that's after some time, they're very old then. Nanda Maharaj is really elderly, right? You know, because the Krishna has grown up, they've gone off to Dwarka, they lived in Dwarka for some time, then they came back to Kurukshetra. Yes. Did, Ma did Nanda Maharaj also come? Yeah, it's mentioned. Yes, Maharaj. The message was sent to the gopis to come. Certainly, the gopis all came because Krishna said, He said, Before, when we went to the wrestling match in Mathura, at that time, all the cowherd boys had come. So, He said, This time to Kurukshetra, cowherd boys should stay back and let the gopis come to Kurukshetra. 
So Kurukshetra is the only place outside Braja where Krishna and Radharani were together. Okay, Nanda Maharaj had also come there, you say? Okay, all right. So they met, he met with Vasudeva because Krishna brought all of his mothers and fathers, and brought everyone from Dwarka. They all came there to Kurukshetra to do the sacrifice and they met all the, peop the people from Vrindavan again. So they just embraced, huh? So that, that was their relationship. But the e etiquette is there, you know, other, the other etiquette. We see uh, tradition, Krishna dealing with the Pandavas. He would bow before Yudhisthira and Bhima. He would embrace Arjuna and Nakula and Sahadev would bow to Krishna. So bowing, sometimes they just pranam, bow the head, and other time maybe get down, on, not all the time they would get down on the ground and offer full obeisances or like that. I don't know how common that was. And we see when Sudama Brahman came to Dwarka, how Krishna worshipped Sudama Brahman. They were also friends, but still, still Krishna worshipped because he's a Brahmana. And Krishna gave him great honour. All right, so, so Vasudev heard his bro that his friend, dear friend and brother had come. And Prabhupada talks about their relationship as brothers. Vasudev's father married a Vaishya girl and from her Nanda Maharaj was born. And then later Nanda Maharaj himself married Yashoda, who was also a Vaishya girl. But Vasudev, he's his father was also Surasena. He had also he had other wives, and he, she he had another wife who was not a Vaishya, and so Vas Vasudev was born from that other lady. So Vasudev is Kshatriya. He kept his Kshatriya caste. So Nanda Maharaj text. 21, Nanda Maharaj heard the uh, Vasudev. Maharaj, can I, can I ask a question, Maharaj, please? Oh, okay, Prabhu. Maharaj, here it is mentioned that Vasudev's father, Shur Sena, married a Vaishya girl. But actually, we have heard that uh, it was a Devamira who had uh, two wives, and uh, one son was Shur Sena and another was Parjanya. And Parjanya's son was Nanda Maharaj. Parjanya had five sons. And one of them was Nanda Maharaj. Okay. So, Maharaj, how these two contradictory statements are here, how do we explain? Because Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and uh, Jiva Goswami both have given that Devamida had uh, two wives. And then from one uh, Kshatriya wife was Shurasena, Vaishya wife he had Parjanya. Then from Parjanya came... Yeah, yes, I saw that. I saw that in the commentaries. The yes, Chandra, so said. how do we say the Prabhupada has written here Shurasena married a Vaishya? Well, I don't know. There may be editing mistakes. I don't know. We have, you can ask Ritayananda Maharaj. <laughs> no, he, he's, he, he's, uh, he's the... He's the author. Gopi Paranadana Prabhu is no longer with us, of course. Oh, no, this is Prabhupada, right? We're reading Prabhupada's work. This is Prabhupada's work. But I don't know how to explain the, contra the difference. Uh, it may be that there's some mistake there in, in editing or something. I don't know. Guru Maharaj, I, I read uh, as many commentaries I can read and then I find out one place I cannot quote, I forgot which one, but it's mentioned, this only proves that Ananda and Vasudev, they have, they're very intimately related, either as brothers or cousins. I will try to find the quote and send Yeah, to they're, the they're in cousin, they're, they're friends and bro the brothers, as you say, could be cousin brothers, yeah, can also be cousin brothers, and India is like that, cousin, they call themselves brothers, but they're different mothers and stuff like that, different mother and father, but same grandfather, so they're like cousins. So, uh, Maharaj, my point was that uh, sometimes it becomes difficult to explain that Prabhupada has written, we cannot say Prabhupada has written wrong, or if there is an editing mistake, Maharaj, it has been going on for so many years, 
so it should have been uh, uh, corrected so how do we explain that this is uh, Prabhupada has written it well Shurasena well I don't know Prabhu I don't think it's a major issue you know I, I wouldn't get hung up about a thing like this you know there are that sometimes there are problems are dif differences you know when we start trying to change things then people really get upset just like you know Jayadweta Swami he corrected some mistakes and he added things in the Bhagavad Gita which were more close to Prabhupada which was actually Prabhupada's words and he got so much flack so much criticism for it so you have to be very careful in doing in changing the Shastras and doing things like that. I don't know, I mean, we can talk to, you, you, if you want, you can write to Dravida Prabhu in the BBT. Yes, Maharaj. That's, you know, and ask him about it. Dravida. Dravida Das Brahmachari in the BBT. And he's usually, and he's found, you well, he'll be on the internet, you should be able to get him. He would be an authority person to ask. And, and he would probably give you a reply also. I don't, Thank you, Maharaj. I don't know, I mean, you know, Krishna Shetra Maharaj may know something, I, I don't know. And Jalangi said she's going to look more into it. <laughs> yes, Guru Maharaj, also I have a comment on this. Yes. <laughs> because recently mm, I find a contradictory point and I wrote a letter to Banu Maharaj. And my question is about uh, Sankarshan and Balaram, because during the Bhagavatam Bhaktivedanta course study, we, uh, when we're studying the first chapter, um, the verse 8, we find out, he said, My dear Shukadev Goswami, you have already explained that Sankarshan, who belongs to the second quadruple, appeared as a son of Rohini named Balarama. So that means Balarama appears from Sankarshan. But then after two days, when I was uh, translating His Holiness Jayapataka Swami Guru Maharaj's class, and he was giving class on Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya Lila, chapter 20, verse 188, he said, So uh, Sri Balarama is a Vaibhava Prakash, manifestation of Krishna. He's also manifested in the original quadruple expansions of Vasudeva. Anyway, this means first we have Balarama, and then we have um, first quadruple and then second quadruple. So, but according to Bhagavatam, we have the second quadruple. Then from second quadruple, Sankarshan, then we have Balaram. So I wrote one letter well, to Well, there, there, di there are different Sankarshans. Oh. Let me see. But I, maybe it's only one line I can share that Banu Mahal said. He said it just means they're non different. Yeah. This is his answer. Very, yeah. very simple. He said, Sankarshan, who belongs to the second quadruple, appeared as a son of Rohini named Balarama, just means they're non different. So, if we can apply the same logic here, either brothers, they have the same father, different mothers, or they have the same grandfather and different grandmothers, they're related as brothers or cousins, not much different. <laughs> no, okay. It, it's a technical point. I don't. I don't want to spend too much time on this. But maybe you could ask Banu Maharaj also about this. <laughs> What's his opinion about this? Banu Maharaj is in Chennai and he has his own, he has his own of course he has he translates the commentaries of the Acharyas, so he would go with the Acharyas. But he may be able to tell you about what's wrong here, if, if this is wrong or, or if it's not wrong. All right, so... Okay, thank you, Guru Maharaj. Going ahead, we think uh, in that purport, Prabhupada talks about Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram and th their particular uh, pastimes in Vrindavan, that Krishna plays the flute and Balaram carries the plow, right? So Krishi Goraksha Vaninam Vaishya Karma Swabhavaja. So Krishi Raksha is Balaram and Goraksha is Krishna. Krishna protects the cows, he uses his flute to call the cows, 
and they respond when they hear the cock. And Lord Balaram, he carries his plough, and he uses his plough to till the soil and to different pastimes he does with the plough. So these two brothers represent these two important aspects of Vedic culture. Farming, the most pious activity, and taking care of the cows, very transcendental service for Krishna. Okay, go, going ahead, text 21. Nanda Maharaj heard that Vasudeva come, he was overwhelmed with love and affection. Seeing Vasudeva suddenly present, he got up and embraced him with both arms. Very nice. Maharaj Parikshit, having thus been received and welcomed by Nanda Maharaj with honour, Vasudeva sat down very peacefully and inquired about his own two sons because of intense love for them. So Nanda Maharaj was taking care of the two sons of Vasudeva. Krishna and Balaram were both there in the home of Nanda Maharaj. Of course, Nanda Maharaj thinks Krishna is his son, and actually he is his son. But Vasudeva is thinking he's his son. <laughs> and Balaram is definitely, that's the son of Rohini. So they're both there and they're both like in the home of Nanda Maharaj. So then text 23, my dear brother Nanda Maharaj, at an advanced age you had no son at all and were hopeless of having one. Therefore, that you now have a son is a sign of great fortune. Yes, very great fortune to have a son, definitely. For a farmer, for somebody who is the Vaishya, you want children because the children will grow up. They help, in the, they help to do the farming. And it's, very, it's very important. When people get married, they will first of all check the astrology charts to make sure that they're compatible and that they can have children. Because marriage is meant for having children, actually and children will make the family prosperous. People think our oh, children are a burden, but actually the children, are, they, they, they're a great help for a family who are in the, in the farming, in the field of farming, taking care of land, taking care of cows. It's very useful to have children. Even if you have a shop, you see the children sit in the shops, the little children, they will take care of the shop on behalf of their parents. So they grow up like that. So Vasudeva is speaking. He says, It's my good fortune that I am seeing you. Having obtained this opportunity, I feel as if I have taken birth again. Even though one is present in this world to meet with intimate friends and dear relatives, it is extremely difficult. Well, definitely in their case, it was difficult because Vasudev had been in to visit him. So it would cert certainly be difficult. Nanda Maharaj uh, was careful. He didn't go to meet Vasudev. He let Vasudev come to meet him. Because if Nanda Maharaj goes to meet Vasudev, then it may bring problems for him. But Vasudev came to meet him. And Vasudev gives an example about how sometimes in the course of trying to be with people, you get separated. You can see the, the, the verse, text number 25. Many planks and stakes unable to stay together are carried away by the force of a river's waves. Similarly, although we are intimately related with friends and family members, we are unable to stay together because of our varied past deeds and the waves of time. So, why do we get separated from each other? What's the cause? We come together as friends, but we can't stay with our friends forever. Why not? What separates us? Time. Yes, it's mentioned here, right? Because of our past deeds and 
the influence of time, the waves of time. Not only time, but also our past deeds, our karma. So it brings us together. Just like, what, what are some examples we give? But straws floating in the river, they come together and then they're separated. Just like we ride on the bus. You get the bus, you sit together on the bus, and then you get off the bus, you never see the people again. You may sit on the bus, you talk to them, and then you get off the bus, you don't see each other again. So that's the nature, material association. So Vasudev was also appreciating that it's very fortunate that we could come together again to be with each other. So Nanda Ma Vasudev wants to ask questions to Nanda Maharaj. Now you meet someone, according to their position and their situation, you have to know how to question them. What will you ask them? Right? What are you going to ask them? You meet somebody who's a Vaishya, like Nanda Maharaj. So Vasudev, he knows, he's asking him. What's he asking him? How are the cows? How is the forest? Is there good grass there? Is there enough water? All of these things, very important for the Vaishya to take care of cows. You've got to have land, you've got to have water and grass. So Nanda Vasudeva was asking him about all this. Now if you meet somebody, if, 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 you're, a, if you're a Kshatriya and you meet another Kshatriya, what are you going to ask him? Atu, Atu Krishna Prabhu, what will you ask if you're a Kshatriya and you meet another Kshatriya, what are you going to talk about? Are, that, are your subjects uh, happy and uh, are your enemies are being under control? Yeah, right. How's your treasury? <laughs> uh, your treasury. <laughs> These kind of things, right. So, we want to get get all of these things taken care of. If you meet a brahmana, what will you ask the brahmana? Are you satisfied? Yes, right. <laughs> and when your Guru Maharaj meets you, what does he ask you? How is your sadhana? How's your sadhana? Right, yes. Are you chanting your rounds? Are you doing well? <laughs> How's your sadhana? Right, that's... Very good. So here you see Vasudev is asking Nanda Maharaj about how's the cows, how's the forest, is there enough water, are the cows, is there any disease? You know, even 5,000 years ago they had to worry about disease. Sometimes you get disease and the government will come, they want to kill all the cows. You get these kind of, you get foot and mouth disease or you know, mad cow disease, that kind of thing. So Vasudev was asking like that. And then text 27, my dear Baladev, oh my son Baladev, sorry, my son Baladev, being raised by you and your wife Yasoda, consi considers you his father and mother. And he's living very peacefully in your home with his real mother Rohini. Hmm. So Vasudev was asking about his own son. Then text 28, friends and relatives are properly situated. One's religion, economic development, sense gratification are beneficial, right? Friends and relatives properly situated. When the relationship is right, then everything is good. Economic development, sense gratification, everything is good. Otherwise, if one's friends and relatives are in distress, these three cannot offer any happiness. These three meaning religion, economic development and sense gratification. They cannot offer any happiness if, someone, if the relatives are in distress. So certainly Nanda, uh, Vasudev and Devaki had been in some distress, Nanda Maharaj would be thinking like that because they'd been in prison. So Vasudev 
informed Nanda Maharaj that although he and his wife and children, although he had his wife and children, he could not properly do his duty of maintaining them and was therefore unhappy. Vas um, Vasudev had several wives. How many wives did he have? Eight. Eight wives. Okay, it's a big job, right? Keep eight wives happy. Not an easy task. Still, they're very wonderful ladies. And Devaki is the best of them. And Rohini, of course, is also very, very special. I think Rohini was the mother of Subhadra. And Subhadra was a very favorite child of Lord Krishna. Devaki is the mother of Subhadra. Devaki is the mother of Subhadra. Yes, I stated like that in the ninth canto. That, that Devaki is the mother of Subhadra. But there are several Subhadras. It's not just one Subhadra. What about, y what about Yashoda's daughter? Yashoda's daughter, that's not Subhadra. That, she was never called Subhadra. You won't see that name Subhadra anywhere in relation to Yashoda's daughter. Okay, so King Kamsa killed so many of your children. Nanda Maharaj is speaking now. King Kamsa killed so many of your children born of Devaki. And your one daughter, the youngest child of all, entered the heavenly planets. Now, when Vasudev hears this, he's very happy. Why? Ananta Borsundar Prabhu, do you know? Why is Vasudev so why is Vasudev so happy to hear Nanda Maharaj he, say? He's very confident that Nanda Maharaj is not aware that Krishna is my son. Yes, right. He's very happy because he now he was wondering, he didn't know. Did, did does Nanda Maharaj know that uh, I'd come there and changed it, I'd substituted the children and I'd taken his daughter? But when he hears this, because Nanda Maharaj is saying, your daughter, so this was actually the daughter born of Mother Yashoda, and she entered the heavenly planets. She, she was a demigod, so she's worshipped in these different places. So Vasudev felt great relief that Nanda Maharaj doesn't know about my ch substituting the children. He thinks the daughter is actually mine. But that daughter was actually his, born of Yashoda. Right? Going ahead, text number 30. Every man is certainly controlled by destiny, which determine the results of one's fruitive activities. In other words, one has a son or daughter because of unseen destiny. And when the son or daughter is no longer present, this also is due to unseen destiny. Destiny is the ultimate controller of everyone. One who knows this is never bewildered. So this is similar to what Kamsa was saying. He was talking about destiny. That it was destiny that these six sons had to die. He told Vasudev and Devaki, it was their destiny. So here also Nanda Maharaj is saying it was destiny, every man controlled. Nanda Maharaj trying to console Vasudev. Vasudev could say, hey, listen, I heard all this before. <laughs> I heard this from Kamsa. Now you're telling me the same thing. <laughs> but anyway, Vasudev is happy because he's thinking that my son, Krishna, is actually here with Nand, is, he's with Nanda Maharaj now. Nanda Maharaj taking care of them. So destiny is being described again, the ultimate controller of everyone. Oh, sometimes it's called providence, sometimes we call it karma, but destiny. We all have our own destiny. We say what, whatever will be, will be. The future is not ours to see. 
So Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he describes in one poem, he wrote, he said, Forget the past which sleeps, and ne'er the future dream at all, but live with times which are with thee, and progress thee shall call. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur encourages us to live in the present, <laughs> and don't dream about the future and forget the past. That's the idea. Okay, text 31. Vasudev said to Nanda Maharaj, Now, my dear brother, since you have paid the annual taxes to Kamsa and have also seen me, do not stay in this place for many days. It is better to return to go cool, since I know that there may be some disturbance. He knows that the situation that you have a ruler, a demonic ruler like Kamsa, with all of his ministers, and they're going around killing young children. So there's a lot of danger around. So he encourages Nanda Maharaj that you should go back home, because Vasudev knows the two children are there, his two sons. And he wants that Nanda Maharaj should be there, because Nanda Maharaj is the senior most of all the cowherd men. And so if he's there, then he will be able to take care of any major issue which may come up. So he encourages him, you should go back. Don't be staying here. You've seen me now, now you better go back. Right? So Sukadeva Goswami said, After Vasudeva advised Nanda Maharaj in this way, Nanda Maharaj and his associates, the cowherd men, took permission from Vasudeva yoked their bulls to the bullock carts and started riding for Goku. Any questions? Nanda Maharaj knows Vasudev is a learned person. Nanda Maharaj is a simple man. He's a farmer. Farmers are basically simple people. But Vasudev is a politician. He's a spa statesman. He's very educated, learned. So Nanda Maharaj has respect for him. And when Vasudev gives him this advice, he thinks, yeah, well, I better go immediately, you're right. So he's packed up and he's going back to go cool. Are we, do we have any questions? Marriages have been very quiet today. Any questions, ladies? No one? I started late, I'm sorry. I, we should go ahead a bit, we should do a bit more. If you, but if you don't have any questions, there's no, it's a short chapter, but there was only 32 texts and not a lot of philosophy. Anyway, just to summarize the chapter, we heard about the birth of Lord Krishna and Nanda Maharaj, how he arranged the Jati the Jata Karma ceremony, the birth ceremony, and how he gave so much charity. How many cows did he give in charity? Two million, right? And then there was so much yogurt and butter, they were throwing it everywhere, and they were rolling in it all over their bodies, smearing it all over their skin. And Nanda Maharaj was giving charity to everyone, whatever they wanted, he would give them. He was happy to give charity to him. Maharaj, <coughs> can I ask a question? Right? Please do. Maharaj, when uh, Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Thakur said, uh, Saralita hi Vaishnav, the simplicity is Vaishnavism. Uh, how do we understand that? Because uh, at times devotees have to be shrewd, diplomatic, for Krishna's service, and yet there are devotees who cannot be shrewd, they are just naturally simple. How do we understand that statement now? Well, everyone according to their nature, not everyone is expected to be so shrewd, but generally simplicity means, you know, if the teacher asks you, do you understand, you will tell him, you won't hide the truth, you won't just say, oh yeah, yeah, I understand and you don't understand. 
or they're giving prasadam and there's not enough prasadam and you want more, but you don't like to say, oh, I'm hungry, I need more. You don't say, oh, I, oh no, no, it's enough Prabhu, it's okay Prabhu, don't worry about it. You know, you're on, <laughs> you try to hide it, cover up. So s simplicity is to be straightforward, speak the truth. But of course, try to speak the truth in a manner which is pleasing. Try to be a, uh, make it kind and palatable. That's the idea. Satyam priyat, satyam priyat, satyam bruyat, priyam bruyat. So simplicity. Yes, at the same time, some t some people have to be very expert in dealing. We see Raghunath Goswami was very expert. When he was a young man, he saved his uncle and that they were going to get in trouble from the, the rulers because he'd done some uh, corruption. But Raghunath Goswami was so clever, he changed. And Sanatan Goswami also, to get out of prison, he had to speak in a very uh, cl clever way to convince the jailer that he was going to go to Mecca and he was going to do pilgrimage there and like that. So he got out of the prison. So sometimes you have to be clever. You have to know. You have to use your intelligence. Yeah. It, it helps, certainly. But we should know when. When we have to use it. And not, to, not to cover up all the time. Not all the... You know, we shouldn't lie and cheat. That's the point. We should... But sometimes you have to do that. <laughs> Prabhupada said that a great soul cheats for a great cause. So sometimes you have to cheat for a great cause. Consider the cause. And then use your... Sim otherwise, maintain simplicity. Yeah? Uh, yes, Maharaj, thank you. But often it is seen that we try to cheat for great cause and then we end up cheating for petty cause. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, sh we have to be careful. So try, we try to do our best, yeah? Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, Any, if there are no other questions, then we'll just finish here tonight. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki. His Holiness Bhakti Vidyavinashak Narasimha Maharaj Ki Jai.